like a 30 minutes, okay? Go so over to the story. I'm going to start my paper with uh, a kind of a note of gratitude to Professor Amit Bhattacharya for suggesting this topic to me. I was actually trying to work something all out on war, uh, which actually ravaged South Asia. But he suggested that well, you should actually work on radio fiction. So that is why I have completed this paper on radio fiction first. Second is I also express my deep gratitude to all the faculty members of the Department of English, University of Gurgongo for inviting me here. And so I should go straight into my paper. It is going to be a somewhat a long one. Even in the 21st century, detective stories, um, especially those written or translated in English, are quite popular around the world among not only the adolescents but also the adults because they perceptively cater to the general obsessions with maintenance of world order, punishment of criminals, and satisfaction of embarking on adventures on unknown paths. But these stories are not always aimed at providing entertainment. As Darius Kimball notes in an e-article of 13th May 2011, South Asia in the 21st century is a more dangerous place to inhabit than ever because of arms production, militancy, and a variety of other factors. And therefore, it can provide a wide and fertile ground for the detectives, real and fictional, to investigate and honor plots of international and international conspiracies or apprehend the wrongdoers with various motives. South Asian native fiction, I may please be uh, uh, permitted to mention here, is almost a misnomer. If someone searches for the term, in example, uh, for example, in Google Books or Gesture, she would normally find, or he would normally find, nothing except for a very limited number of essays on the Indian or Bangladesh detective writing stories. Detective fiction, as it transfers from typical writings like Melissa Flynn's Dirty Linen or Imona Shidiki's The Cesspool of Empire, matured as a Western and primarily imperialist phenomenon. The postcolonial phase of the detective stories, as for example, Dorian Sir writes in Writing Murder began as soon as England became remarkably multicultural in the 20th century and gradually spread to other parts of the world in detective stories written by others, including Eastern countries as well. In an age where world literature as a term is first gaining importance and attracting mentionable amount of research and seminar discussions, would be guilty of selective reading and deliberate obliviousness if we really get ourselves to reading only the Indian or Bengali detective stories while attempting to enrich our knowledge of, for example, popular fiction in Pakistan or the uh, and Sri Lanka literatures. Conferring of international literary hours and the ever increasing popularity of the diasporic novelists from South Asian countries like Bangladesh, Pakistan and Sri Lanka have led to people taking special notice of literature from these nations. Before proceeding with my very brief review of the subgenre of South Asian literary fiction, if such a term exists, I would like to mention that South Asian culture, like in many other subgenres, is amply portrayed in South Asian native fiction as well. This occurs particularly when the South Asian fiction detectives interact with local populace, interrogate them, chase the criminals around. It also, it is also focused when the detectives share food or use democratic language. In crime fiction in South Asia, Laura Broek and Francis Carson, it has been a newly published in 2022, Note three characteristic features of South Asian detective fiction. First, the pre 1940s detective stories, especially those written by the Indian literatures, were marked by localization and regionality. Second, by the 1950s and 1970s, South Asian detective fiction had come out of its celebration of the post colonial and indigenous news of the 1930s, like Bonkish Bokshi, and had moved towards the cosmopolitanism of detectives from other South Asian countries like Pakistan. Third, South Asian reality fiction in the last decade of the 20th century entered the so-called hard-boiled phase again in India and the vernacular Britishness of that form's language and heroes became one of its defining features during this period. Even a casual review of the features of South Asian reality fiction between the 1930s and 2000s reveals these post-colonial features. I'm going to skip that and that over. Among the South Asian nations, Afghanistan, Bhutan, and Maldives do not, apparently, seem to have a wide, well-defined body of dating fiction in their respective literatures. Though, in case of Afghanistan, 
There are occasional stories by directors like Joe, Joe App, that is Joe App's story which is published in 2022, uh, 2002. Money Like Joya, uh, Omen Among Landers, which is published in 2009. And Nadia Hasini, A House Without Windows, which is published in 2016, that deal with the element of crime and sometimes with detection as well, though very informally. This also occurs in select Afghanistan-based books written by non-Afghan writers like Rajas Talwar's An Afghan Winter, which was published in 2012, Alex Bellinson's The Shadow Patrol, which was published in 2012, and Robert Cress's Suspect, which was published in 2013. Similarly, <coughs> there are some other crime or detective stories set in the Maldives as well. But they are mostly by writers who do not live in the Maldives. These include Clive Kuzler's The Storm, 2012, Marty Macrae's Lady Sun, 2015, Naomi Davis's uh, Maldives Adventure, 2016, Trina Seskis' The Honeymoon, 2017, Sanchita Sarin's It's a very famous book now, right now, so it's widely purchased, Modern in the Maldives, 2019, and Holy Wives' The Hunt and the Kill, in 2021. I quote from an article by Paul French, he says, The Maldives may be many people's idea of paradise, a dream holiday, the perfect honeymoon. But in the world of crime fiction, it's almost definitely a paradise going seriously wrong. The Maldives are, uh, form a number of islands about 750 miles offshore of Sri Lanka in the Indian Ocean and straddling the equator, meaning year-round good weather. The local population is of course soiled by the massive holiday trade. The number of resorts has bloomed in the, uh, boomed in the recent decades and it is easy, easily the Maldives' main source of income with over 5,50,000 international tourists in the last good year before the COVID-19 pandemic hit. <coughs> Though it is said the numbers are bouncing back first, so 